So without further ado, you know, today we're really talking about uh, the impact that your choices in via design have on, you know, your, your high speed uh, signal transmissions. And they obviously play an important role, otherwise we wouldn't be having this webinar. Um, uh, two sentences about Sierra. So Sierra circuits were full service. Uh, everything is captive. So we have our own design team, uh, our own fabrication team, our own assembly team and our own supply chain team uh, to handle components and small box build type things. So uh, we've been around um, doing very complex PCBs as well as quick cycle time uh, PCBs. So if you haven't used us already, please uh, request a quote and see, let's see where that goes. We appreciate that. Again, these are the two speakers. Steve Carney should also be there um, for future. And then here are, here's the table of contents. So we'll talk about the overall impacts and Ernie will set that up as well with his demo. And then we'll talk about some so potential solutions and the manufacturing uh, side of it, so the practical side of it as well, and how that impacts cost. So definitely VIAs play a critical role in the high-speed uh, signal transmission. So here are some of the ways and how they inf influence the signal integrity. So VIAs can introduce uh, impedance changes along the signal path. So one example, layman's example that I could use is, you know, if you have pipes in your house and the pipes keep changing sizes, you're going to have very irregular water flow. Um, and so that could be an analogy for, you know, the discontinuities that you would have. So doing, due to variations in the via geometries and placements of your vias, uh, the signals traveling through these different vias may experience skew, uh, resulting in discrepancies in arrival times. So that's one issue. Uh, longer via stub lengths can introduce additional resistance and capacitance, uh, leading to higher signal attenuation. And uh, also when vias are closely spaced, the EM fields generated by adjacent signal tracers can interfere with each other, in inducing crosstalk. And then uh, lastly, improper via placement can disrupt the return pass for signals, causing ground bounds and power delivery noise. So these are really important to keep track of as well um, in terms of your via placements. So we're gonna go over design techniques uh, to achieve better signal integrity. And so in managing your via discontinuities, if the via impedance does not match the transmission line impedance, this is when the signals passing through the via may reflect back. And so the magnitude of this reflection depends on the difference between the impedance of the trace and the via at that transition point. And to reduce the impedance discontinuity, uh, you can implement a coaxial via structure where the signal via at the center is surrounded by multiple ground vias. So you need to position the ground vias near the signal vias to create a proper inductance loop for the return current. We're gonna do a quick demo of our V impedance calculator. I'll hand it over. Hello, everyone. Uh, Sierra Circuits VR Impedance Calculator uses the physical dimensions of a VR to calculate its capacitance, inductance, and impedance. The tool implements numerical solutions of Maxwell's equations to render accurate and consistent results. The tool supports two types of VR models, through hole and laser VR models. Each of these models have four VR structures, the through hole VR with single and two reference planes, and the through hole back drill VR with single and two reference planes. Similarly, for the laser VR, we have the blind and buried VR with single and two reference planes. Uh, for now, let us choose a through hole VR with a single reference plane. Uh, the diagram of the chosen VR model is on the left side and the units can be changed using these drop downs here. Uh, enter the dielectric information now. H1 is the dielectric below the reference plane. Let's take a height of 29.5 and a dielectric constant of 4. H2 is the dielectric above the reference plane. 
Let's take it as 29.5 and a dielectric constant of 3.6. Dielectric constant E3 is the dielectric of the inner surface of the VI here. So let's take it as 1. Uh, for VI information, the VI diameter, we have 6 mils. Antipad diameter, 24 mils. Annular pad, 16 mils. Uh, sorry, uh, annular pad here, 16 mils. The via pad diameter, 7 mils. The via plating thickness, 1 mil. Annular pad thickness of 1.5 mils and a reference plane thickness of 0.7 mils. Click on calculate here. And the capacitance, inductance, characteristic impedance, propagation delay, propagation delay per unit length, and the effective dielectric constant of the chosen geometry will be displayed here. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Oh, share my screen. Oops, sorry. So uh, back drilling is a technique that I'm going to talk about before Ernie gives his demo, which can reduce your via stubs. So a via stub basically is an inactive portion of a via that forms a resonant circuit with a specific frequency. Signals operating at this frequency or its odd harmonics encounter impedance mismatches, leading to the signal attenuation that you don't want. So to prevent signal attenuation caused by via stub resonance, ensure the signal's maximum frequency is significantly lower than the stub's resonant frequency, and this will avoid the excitation of the resonant circuit by the signal. So one effective way to eliminate via stubs is the back drilling. So you can keep the via stub length as at a minimum as possible, um, less than 120 to the resonant uh, wavelength. So from a practical standpoint, uh, DFM tips for uh, back drilling um, are important to know. So ensure that your back drill, of course, is slightly larger than the original uh, drill that you're that you're drilling. So typically it's uh, five mil over the drill size uh, with a pot tolerance of three mils. Um, and then I would say that um, you know you probably need a 10 mil 10 mils of clearance as well. So I would ask Steve Carney to comment on any of these. To me, these are standard rules and guidelines, but we can definitely do better than standard. So, uh, Steve Carney, do you have any comments on DFM for back drill? Yeah, so a couple of things. Um, most of our, um, virtually all our drill machines now are the newer setup. So um, the trick, part of the trick is a couple of tricks with back drilling. Um, you need to control the depth that you're going into the board. Um, our machines have a uh, depth control sensor. It's actually a feedback system from the uh, from the top of the panel to the tip of the drill. So now we have the ability to go in and, and tell the program we want to go down 10 mil. Um, the machine senses exactly where the tip of the drill is and goes down 10 mil. So we're with this system, we're able to hold a depth tolerance of plus or minus a half a mil. Um, we use um, part of the problem when you do a back drill, um, you get what we refer to as, as pigtails. Um, so you're kind of pulling up the copper because the hole starts out, the whole hole is barrel plated. So the trick is to get the copper out uh, cleanly. So we use, um, it requires a special uh, point on the drill bit. And then in some cases, we'll uh, use an end mill, which is essentially a flat point. Um, the drill diameter, um, five mils is okay. If you can go a little bigger, um, that's better. It, um, it um, you know, we're, we're removing um, sometimes some fairly heavy plated copper in the hole. So if you try and go too small, um, the uh, the drill bit will, will catch and, and snap in the hole. So it's uh, definitely better to be the five mils above. Um, 
other than that, it's uh, everything looks pretty good. Um, so we do use back drilling um, to clean out the stub. We also use it to um, break connections on layers. So we have that option too. Okay, great. Thanks for that. Uh, so I think that actually there's another demo. Uh, okay, hold on. So this is before and after for back drilling. So yeah, here you have on the left a um, an example of the via stub, and um, you know it's a drill hole with plating in the via, and then you have the back drill happens, and then uh, I guess the pigtail situation that. Steve Carney was talking about in terms of removing the stub, but though this is basically um, the before and after of uh, back drill. Uh, quick, another quick demo. Here you go, Linda. Yes, thank you. Uh, so here we have the maximum VS stub length calculator. Uh, this calculator helps to determine the optimum stub length and its resonant frequency. At resonant frequency, a VS stub functions as a resonant circuit uh, and can store maximum energy. Hence, the length of the VS stub should be within an acceptable range to avoid signal integrity issues. Uh, to calculate the maximum VS stub length, you need to ent enter a dielectric constant, uh, for example, 4, and select one of the input parameters here. That is a maximum data transfer rate, fastest signal rise time, maximum frequency content, or the 3 dB bandwidth. Uh, let's, let's take maximum frequency content, for example, and enter a value of 12 gigahertz and click on calculate stub. So here the maximum via stub length and the resonant frequency along with the remaining parameters, that is the DTR, fastest signal rise time, and the 3 dB bandwidth is calculated and displayed. Uh, Let's take another scenario where I take the maximum data transfer rate and enter seven, for example, and click on calculate stub. Uh, so the values here are calculated and displayed again. Uh, as observed at higher frequencies, for example, the 20 gigahertz, the VR stubs are smaller and can cause serious signal integrity issues. Since micro VR do not have a stub, the VR stub issues can be avoided by lasing laser micro VRs. Thank you. Thanks, Bandana. Okay. So now we're uh, switching over to a demo by uh, Ernie from EMA. Hey, hello everyone. <clears throat> okay, so what I'm going to do is a quick demonstration that's going to show the effects of back drilling vias. Uh, if any of you were on the previous webinar that we did on termination, you remember that I used Sigurdy, uh, Cadence Sigurdy topology workbench to do a time domain analysis of the signals. We, we terminated it correctly and we could see we had a reasonably looking uh, waveform, okay? Time domain simulations are used for waveform simulations like this and also used for eye diagrams, okay? We picked out a signal on that board, and I'm going to use the same signal for the demo this, this time. It's a DDR uh, DQ9 signal. By the way, you'll notice you'll be talking about termination strategies, and you can see here that there is the dog bone types uh, termination or, or routing that uh, is used for a BGA right here, where it go, you immediately go to the through hole via. And also there is, as you can see, a adjacent um, ground pin. And that adjacent ground pin is supplying the, uh, the return current that they were talking about when he was talking about a grounding structure. In this case, it's one of them, not four. Uh, the four different, you know, circling the point where the ground is usually used for very high frequencies. Here's the 3D picture of that. And you can see that it is a through-hole via so that the trace itself is not on the bottom layer. So there's a 
stub that we've been talking about in this particular signal. When I did the original analysis, we did a we did a extraction of that particular trace, and we got a driver going to a very small piece of trace that goes to a via, and the larger trace then back to a via, and then through that small piece of trace and back to the receiver. Okay, and then again, these are the results that we got when we did that simulation. However, the, we, the data rate, as you can see down here, is only one gigabit. So let's say we're interested in knowing whether that particular cha channel can support higher rates of data. So for this, we're going to use a tool from Cadence called Sigurdy Power SI. So we'll do a frequency domain analysis, and we'll use it to develop an S-parameter model. And that model would tell us a lot about what's happening in the circuit. For those of you who aren't familiar with, what an S-parameter model is basically a matrix. It has a value S11, which is the reflected energy caused by, you know, in, in, in continu now do it is, et cetera. It's got a S21, which is the pa pass-through energy. It's also got a reflection off the receiver side and a pass back from the receiver side. So these four numbers make up a matrix. And if we look at those results, we can see a lot about the particular thing. So let's go ahead and do a simulation of that same structure we had before. Okay. So I've done this sim simulation at first with just the way the signal was. And you can see here, this is what the S21, this is the pass through energy. And you can see that at area we were operating about one gigahertz, the effect of the, the, uh, the, the uh, extra via, the via stub was negligible. But as you can see, as I go up in higher frequencies towards 10 gigahertz, it becomes much more significant. So let's see if we can make a difference by going in and uh, changing the Vs. So I'm gonna go in and zoom on this particular V, and I'm able to back drill it from here. And so what I'm doing is I'm drill, drilling it from the bottom of the board to layer eight, which is where the signal is in the system. So I go ahead and enable that V, and you can see now that that V has been removed by a back drill. And then we're gonna go and go over and do the same with the other via. And now I'm gonna repeat the simulation. So it's just to take a, about 20 seconds to run. And while it's running, you can, you, I'll see, I'll be able to determine, get an S parameter model for the new, new um, arrangement of the back drills and see whether that makes any difference in the simulations itself. You'll see that by the way, it's defaulting to show me S11, which is the reflected energy of both the driver and the receiver side. Okay, uh, I'm gonna just make this a little larger so that you can see more, can see better what it's, what it's looking like properties. Okay, I'm going to change it to five mils. Okay. Okay. So now you can see that there, there, there was still reflected energy back. Okay. And there's, you can also see the rev resonances. When I used this example, what the resonances told me was that I did not have a good match of the via impedance to the traces because those resonances are caused by reflections off the via itself. Okay, but it turns out that they're much smaller than the through, so I'll be able to tell what's going on. So what I do is I change this, I change the simulation results to show the uh, insertion loss or the pull, pull pass through energy on the particular design. Again, I'm going to take it and make it w wider so you can see it. Uh, properties five. Okay, and now what I'm gonna do is load in the original data so that we can do a compare. I go in and load the data, and it's showing me the S11, so I'm gonna go over and show the, the other data, the uh, pass-through data. Okay, for our channel filter, and 
Okay, show that energy, and I'm gonna, and then I'm gonna make it uh, again larger so that you can see it. So properties make this five. So this was the this is this is the original data before I had did the back drill, and you can see that it the, we were able to reduce significantly the amount of energy that was lost passing the circuit through that particular design. So that's the effect of the back drills on the actual signal integrity of the of the signal passing through the vias. That completes my demonstration. Thank you. Uh, that was great, thanks. Uh, okay. Someone is asking, actually, Ernie, um, what tool you're using to simulate these transmission line effects. We're using uh, Cadence's uh, Sigrity uh, signal integrity analysis tools, both of, in both cases. Okay, great. Okay, so I will go back to the presentation. So we'll go over a few uh, examples of techniques that can help. Um, and, you know, in terms of high speed, I would say like, think of all this technique as, you know, somewhere in the 10 gigahertz range. Uh, you know, if you're working on, you know, DDR or PCI Express or, you know, things like that, I would say those are good you know, applications. And then uh, I would love uh, that we do another webinar on RF microwave type applications, which this also becomes important. So more on that later. So ground stitching vias is, you know, one uh, technique. So you're connecting, uh, you, the ground stitching vias connect the ground guard traces around the signal lines to the ground planes. Uh, and this provides better shielding for the signal trace and reduces EMI. So stitching vias reduce the risk as well of, you know, board warpage, delamination, you know, other uh, mechanical impacts that you can have. So ground stitching is great. Um, the only downside of ground stitching is uh, if you don't design it properly, um, you might not get the effects of that you're looking for electrical effects, but you will get the extra costs associated with uh, ground stitching. So just be careful on, on the rules that you use. Uh, via shielding is also a good technique. Um, so you're basically uh, enclosing around the critical vias to mitigate uh, any EMI and crosstalk. And to provide a low impedance path for EMI currents, connect the metallic enclosures to a ground plane. And this helps dissipate unwanted electromagnetic energy. So when placing shields around signal vias or traces, minimize the loop area as well so that you can reduce EMI and crosstalk. So to prevent unintended coupling effects, uh, be, be careful uh, to avoid contact between the shields and the adjacent vias and maintain a minimum spacing of 2W between the shield of vias to prevent uh, coupling effects. So we're gonna go through some examples of routing VGAs uh, using VN pad and dog bone structures, uh, more of the practical side of routing. So VN pad technology uh, basically means you're placing vias directly underneath uh, pads that will get solder on them. So this allows for more efficient signal routing and enhanced thermal performance, as well as mechanical uh, support. And these vias are filled with an epoxy and capped over with copper. So step one is, you know, drill. Step two is plate with copper. Step three is fill with epoxy. Step four is bake uh, and 
planarize, and step five is plate over with copper. And so this will be a mechanical strength to prevent any solder from flowing down into the via. Uh, so all important. So how, like when you're routing, what kind of VN pad can you use? If you can get away with it, um, you can have VN pad that uh, is less than, let's say, 30% coverage of the pad, you probably shouldn't worry about the solder wicking into that via. Uh, but if it's any more than that, then, or in the center of the pad, you definitely need to fill it um, for the mechanical support. Uh, and when you're des designing your solder mask, again, a, pra a very practical point, um, you know, how do you want the solder mask uh, to be uh, on the design for your critical pads? Is that something you can discuss with your assembly shop? You can discuss with us. Um, but uh, here are some basic rules that we have, uh, you know, for designing, designing your mask. Here's a case study of a 0.4 millimeter BGA um, microcontroller. So there's a six layer rigid flex PCB uh, with a mic, uh, BGA with a 0.4 millimeter pitch. And so we must maintain about 4.25 space on both sides of a four mil trace for a half ounce copper weight. Uh, so you have to know what your fabricator is able to etch in what amount of copper. Um, that's important for your breakout design. Uh, so here the air gap between the inner pins is 6.89 and between the BGA is 5.75. So to fan out the inner pins um, with tight spacing, we implemented BN pad with blind vias, laser drill blind vias from six to five. And then um, the blind vias were connected to layer five, to a through hole. And similarly, the to break out the BGA, we incorporated VN pad through the center of the BGA. Here's an example of dog bone routing. So using you know short traces, um, you can connect directly to a nearby via um, uh, and then on the inner layers as well. So there shouldn't be any mass clearances for uh, the vias under the BGA. You want to cover those vias and you wanna make sure that even you could possibly plug those vias with solder mask, ask your fabricator what they're design rule is, but you want those vias to be small enough that when you cover them with mask, that the mask doesn't fall into the via. Uh, here's some specifics. So for a one millimeter BGA pitch, the air gap between adjacent pads is 19.68 mils. And considering a ball pad of 20.08 mils, a five mil trace can pass without any D or C issues. And the air gap between pads of a 0.5 millimeter pitch BGA is 9.03 mils. And when working with a 10.63 mil ball pad, a three mil wide signal can pass without with an optimum uh, trace clearance. So just as a rule of thumb, uh, you can use dog bone for a pitch greater than 0.5 millimeter. Uh, when it gets to 0.5 millimeter, you should use switch to VN pad routing. And that's a good rule of thumb. And so other via manufacturing consideration, considerations as well. Uh, according to IPC 22221, uh, uh, you need to ensure you have sufficient pad dimension um, for reliable electrical connectivity. Uh, and you need therefore a minimum pad size. And so here is what IPC 22221 showcases. Uh, the pad size should be um, basically calculated by the drill size uh, plus two times the annular ring requirement. 
And here are some examples for based on density levels. You don't have a very dense board versus if you do have a dense board, your annular rate uh, will definitely go down. Which is okay, but just make sure your fabricator can, you know, build to that. And if you're building anything with class three, annular ring becomes uh, definitely a concern for all fabricators. And so here are the guidelines that Sierra has for class three, which I think are pretty much universal to all fabricators. But knowing your annular ring requirements for your class three board is critical uh, before you start your layout. So with a blind via, which also uh, is, you know, optimizing your electrical performance, you have to watch out for the aspect ratio. Uh, so meaning you really can't drill, laser drill through a lot of material and successfully shape the laser drill and successfully plate the laser drill or even fill it. So you need the optimal size and the optimal size for most people around the world is 0.75 to one. Uh, and an easy aspect ratio for through holes is 10 to one, um, which would also incorporate pretty much any type of design, including class three. Uh, and then based on the fabricator, you can go up to 12 to one, 15 to one. Um, I think those are all in the safe, more or less safe zone. So just a quick um, uh, calculation of uh, aspect ratio. And then going back to you know tenting tenting your vias, uh, really important both you know basically for your performance of the board as well as like manufacturability. You never want any solder to flow into the vias. Um, so tenting is, you know, always a little bit better to as a process. Um, so you're basically with tenting, you're exposing, you're covering any exposed vias with solder mask. Um, and you can, depending upon when you do your surface finish before or after mask, those vias would have, um, you know, plating, surface finish plating in them. But it basically ensures, you know, that things are not going into the via that you have, uh, you know, less exposure of those vias to the environment. Uh, and it's better for, you know, thermal and electrical performance. I would put uh, notes on the fab drawing as well as, um, you know, design your solder mask layer uh, to tent over the vias. Going back to filling, so you have an option of filling your your plated vias with um, con a conductive fill or a non-conductive fill. And uh, we prefer a non-conductive fill. And if you need more, um, you know, thermal conductivity or heavier current application, I would just plate a little bit more in the via and then uh, do a non-conductive fill after for the mechanical support. One thing to be cautious of, don't fill all your vias. Um, don't stack laser drills on top of a filled sub via. And you know, understand that there could be uh, CTE concerns uh, as well. So you have to take a look at that uh, carefully not to come into issues with uh, CTE mismatches. Uh, here's a quick uh, shot of our via fill uh, tank. So we hold the board, the panel vertically and whatever vias you want filled have been drilled and plated. The other vias have not gone through that process. So this squeegee machine basically pushes the non-conductive epoxy paste into the open vias. And then after that, we bake and then we sand down or planarize to get the smooth surface again. And this process is a very normal process. We use it all the time um, for the boards we're assembling. And uh, the only 
caveat is uh, also to understand the, the plating on the surface and whether you can meet your wrap requirements, um, if your design can meet the wrap requirements. For that, I would talk to your fabricator if you have a design that that's, you know, that's a little bit more complicated. Here's a quick uh, you know, rule of thumb. We drill a lot of holes and we inspect every hole uh, at Sierra. And you know, you clean every hole, inspect every hole. Uh, and so, you know, but you can still, you know, if one hole is bad on a board, then that board is is definitely scrap. So just a thought on on reliability uh, of of vias, you know, as in manufacturing. In terms of a cost comparison, um, I think the most expensive and complicated is to build buried vias. Uh, and primarily this increases the number of laminations and the and the amount of steps that you have to go through to build your circuit board. It's like building two in one circuit boards. Um, next level is the via fill process. It is expensive because you have to go through drilling separately uh, and you have to go through plating separately and then you have the process of via fill. And then, you know, standard via is, is the least expensive. Uh, it's only one process. Can also be expensive if you're drilling very small vias. And then lastly, back drilling is, it does add a drilling step but it's probably the least expensive option uh, to deal with um, via stubs. If you do have to use laser drill microvias and you do have to have a buried laser drill microvia, if you can stagger them, that is all the better uh, because staggering is easier to manufacture, it's lower cost, and it's a more reliable uh, circuit board. And we have lots of good guidelines on how to stagger in the spacing that you need. It, it's a little design dependent, uh, so but we have good DFM guides and you can always reach out to us uh, for more details on your specific design. But here's an example of a, of a board that has a buried via from four to 13 that will go through the drilling process and the plating process, and you don't have to mechanically fill that with a non-conductive epoxy. You can have the resin during lamination process fill that uh, via. And then this, that would be the first lamination. And then in the other uh, laser drill vias that are depicted, you would laminate uh, going out. So layer three to layer 14 would be the next layers that would be laminated on, you would laser drill, and then you would uh, plate with copper. And if you're stacking your vias, now you have to fill that copper via all the way up with uh, copper. If you're staggering, you don't need to do that. You just do a quick plate and get good connection and you're done. And then you'd laminate the next layer pair, uh, 215, and then follow the same process with the laser drill and the plating, and then the last layer pair, uh, layer one, 16. So that's an example of a very complex board um, with many laminations, uh, but, you know, very possible, very doable these days. Um, here's an example of a stacked via and what that looks like. So it does take up less space. Uh, but again, it does come with um, issues. And I'm wondering if Steve Carney would like to speak to, you know, stacked vias versus stagger, um, maybe as it relates to registration as well. Jimmy, um, comments? Yeah. So um, we do a lot of stacked vias. Um, I mean, the, the staggered vias are easy to manufacture because you don't need to fill them. Um, but we do a lot of stacked vias. We stack vias on the um, on a usually it's a center core um, through hole 
conductive fill capped off and then we'll start uh, landing on that via and build out. Uh, one of the things that you want to do too with um, either stack or anytime you get into a laser um, via, you want to um, use what they refer to as either a flat glass or a spread glass um, prepreg in there. It, uh, it helps with the material consistency because you're always, um, the way the laser works, it's a certain amount of energy is going to remove a certain amount of material. So the more consistent you have the material, the better off your laser vias are. Um, a couple of things that we do, um, the fill plate chemistries have gotten a lot better. So we're able to consistently fill the laser vias. Um, the current geometries that we're using, it's a little bit different. Uh, most of what you see here is more of a funnel shape. Uh, we're um, actually going down um, more of a straight sidewall. It's a little bit trickier to plate, but um, you get a, a larger capture pad diameter, so you have more area to adhere the laser to. Uh, one of the couple of things that um, we look at when you get into, uh, particularly with stacked laser vias um, and sequential laminations, every time you go into the press, the material shrinks. So you're dealing with both a um, Z axis expansion and then a X and a Y um, movement. So if you take a 12 by 18 panel to start with, we're growing it like 20 mils in the 12 axis and almost 30 mils in the 18. So you have this um, this lateral stress that you're putting on the stack vias as well. But um, there's new materials that are coming out that are specifically designed for this. So um, actually the uh, stack vias overall are, are getting better to manufacture. And unless there's questions, that's about all I have for that. There were some questions in regards to the shape again. Uh, maybe you answered that already, but the shape of the vias, whether it's stacked or staggered, the shape's going to be the same, right? Yes. And then the the stacking, uh, well, and then also the shape. Can you just like say what the ideal shape of the via is again? So, um, yeah, um, what we're running right now is... Um, we're almost straight on the sidewalls because um, we're trying to increase the area of the capture pad. So we're like 80, 90 percent um, of the uh, of the diameter on the capture pad. Um, the reason everything was funnel shaped to begin with, one of the big issues uh, when you go into electrolysis copper, when you metalize the hole, um, that chemistry, when it initializes, it outgasses hydrogen. So everybody got these neat little um, ring voids at the bottom of the laser vias because the bubbles would sit in there, um, the hydrogen bubbles would sit in there and um, restrict plating. So that's why the, you see all these drawings, they're funnel shape because that allowed the, um, allowed the chemistry to flow through there better, but um, it when you reduce the the primary failure um, for a laser via is the interface between the landing and the copper plating of the via because you have electroless copper in there. Um, so um, anyway, by increasing the capture pad, um, you drastically um, increase the reliability of the laser via. Um, but then we've set it up so we control the electroless copper so we don't have the um, have the outgassing issue and the bubble entrapment. So we're more, if you look at our, our vias, they're virtually almost straight down the sidewall there. They're not V-shaped anymore. Okay, thanks. Uh, so I think there's a few more slides. So we kind of talked about the reliability of stack vias already. Um, so, you know, there's, 
there's everything that Steve Carney had mentioned is critical as well as, you know, the material appropriate for stack vias uh, and laser drilling in general. Uh, and, you know, as those things play a role and then what's the environment the circuit board will be uh, succumb to. Here's a quick example of an eight layer board with stack vias. So one to three, one to four, and five to eight. Uh, so here, you know, you have to make sure that again, we're sticking to a 0.75 aspect ratio. Um, so there would be a typical example where you'd want, you know, like if you have five mils of dielectric, you'd want six mil drill size. Uh, and then you might have a space constraint uh, in terms of the how big the laser drill can be. So that's why it's important to talk to the fabricator to make sure the materials uh, and the press out thickness that's going to happen is appropriate to your uh, design and it can also meet you know your you know your space constraints as well as any control impedance requirements. So those that's how you know those rules all play against each other in this type of a design. So very important to talk to your fabricator. Uh, just a quick tip um, on you know drill a copper. Uh, drill of copper is important. It's not really in the DRCs, and it's not necessarily taken care of by annular ring. Uh, so make sure that you know if you have a, especially if you have a, a high layer count board, let's say eight layers and above, that you're very conscientious of what your drill of copper uh, is. And most board shops want eight. Um, so in terms of PCB via design clearances. Uh, minimum clearance between via and routed or scored edges uh, would be 10 in most cases, unless you have an advanced requirement. Uh, drill to copper is eight. Again, if you have a lower layer count, like a four layer board or six layer board, probably most fabricators can do better than eight mil drill to copper. But if your layer count goes up, you'd want to you know, keep to an eight mil drill to copper. And then there's a discussion on antipad and then the via clearance from solder mask as well. Oops. I think that pretty much concludes, um, you know, with one more tip uh, again, which is as the copper weight relates to the tracing space, uh, you know, to know what that, what your fabricators table is for that is really important. Uh, and then understanding how the fabricator is gonna plate that layer. Are they gonna start with more copper or start with less copper uh, and then plate up, how much they're gonna plate up. You know, ask your fabricator, know how they're, you know, building your board that, that can be really important. So again, we have a lot of good resources. Here's some of the citations um, for what was mentioned here today, as well as we have a design guide and you can always reach out to me specifically uh, via email or text or LinkedIn and, you know, check out our reference materials. Uh, we have a whole slew of design guides, um, which, you know, have all kind of gone through expert uh, review. And something new is our Sierra Connect so that you know, these types of questions and interactions don't have to be limited to webinars, that you can ask questions on our community platform and experts either at Sierra or around the, around the different companies can answer your questions. Uh, so that's a moderated uh, forum by Lucy. So I think it's a great resource uh, for designers out there. Thank you, Amit. Thank you, Steve and Ernie. Uh, before we move on uh, to the Q&A, can you please answer a couple of questions? OK, there you go. Thank you. There's quite a bit of questions and 
I don't think we this is the right place to answer them all, but I, I would say, you know, direct people back to the forum. Um, and so other people can, you know, share in the questions and answers. But yeah, there's a lot of good questions and answers. And then, um, Yes, I can send the link uh, to the forum thread where you can post your questions if we don't have time to answer them today. Yeah. But okay, I'm going to close the poll. Thank you very much, everyone. And uh, yeah, I mean, you can get started on the Q&A. Sure, I'll do, I'll do a few, no problem. Uh, Steve, Steve Carney, uh, there is a question about play, the planarization process. Um, what's the concern about planarization and is it, are we uniformly planarizing the whole panel or just certain areas? That was the question. Um, yeah, we planarize the entire panel. Um, the biggest concern is just controlling the amount of material that you're taking off. Uh, you need what, um, they refer to it as wrap. So, uh, when you do the um when you do the um the filled hole the v and pad hole um essentially you need to um leave enough copper there so you get a, a copper wrap um so you're not um you don't have the barrel of the hole equal to the um surface copper because then you run into a cracking problem so um we're good at controlling that um couple of notes on that um, that uh, machine that you saw for the via fill uh, that's kind of the latest greatest that's actually a vacuum chamber uh, that um, helps keep the air out of the um, out of the hole so we're not trying to push the paste in the hole and the air is pushing it back out so we get a, a much better um, fill and we get less paste on the surface so we minimize the amount of planarization. Uh, we also have a, um, um, a newer generation uh, planarizer. It, um, it uses a, um, they refer to it as a flat brush. So it's not like a piece of sandpaper. It's a, um, it's a wet process. And the, um, the abrasive materials actually more swept across the surface. So it has a, um, it, it has a much more consistent um, material movement. Um, and then we do a lot of, um, we do a lot of uh, measurements of the copper thickness as we're going through the process. So it's kind of complicated. Um, just to give you a quick example though, um, on a busy month, we'll drill about 40 million holes here and 70% of those get uh, filled. So does that answer the question, hopefully? Uh, yes, yes. And uh, there was a question about, um, you know, capture pad. So a capture pad, what is a capture pad exactly in the laser drill structure? And then I think you might as well just say like, what's the right size of the capture pad? So, um, yeah, so the capture pad is um, the connection you're landing on, you're landing the laser on. Um, you typically want, um, you want it at least four mil over. So if you're drilling a, um, say a six mil hole, uh, you'd want a 10 mil pad. I mean, we can do smaller, but it's, um, that's kind of the rule of thumb. Uh, really what you want to do is um, we do, um, we do, we use straight UV for all our laser drilling. Um, what that enables us to do is um, it's a little bit trickier because it'll go through the copper, it'll go through the dielectric. If you're not careful, it'll keep going through the copper um, and it doesn't stop. So the advantage though is um, 
we can it has much more controls uh, the other um, the other technique is to use the uv to cut the copper and then co2 to remove the dielectric um, the problem with that is it um, it's reflected off the copper the co2 is reflected off the copper so it can blow into the sidewall of the via so you get more of a bowl shape um, so we moved away from that uh, so it's a straight UV, we get a, a straighter sidewall, and we also um, actually texture the landing pad, the capture pad, so we get better plating adhesion to it. Um, the main thing that you need to watch out for is um, the copper on the capture pad. The thickness on the capture pad should be, rule of thumb, is to be twice what you're, what you're going through on the top. So typically we use the nine micron, um, which is about a three and a half tenths foil thickness on the top. And we're landing on a half ounce or, or seven tenths on the bottom. So that seems to work pretty good. Um, one of the pictures that, um, that it did show in the presentation, it showed a cavity in there. Uh, we try really hard to not have cavities uh, when you're landing a, um, a stack via. Yeah, you're landing the laser on there, and if you have any voiding or anything, it has a tendency to uh, boil right away and blast out. So anyway, we try and avoid that. Um, so anyway, hopefully that answers that question. Oh, uh, yeah, no, that was good. Um, let's see. I think uh, we're at the top of the hour. Um, it might be a good time to close. Uh, there was quite a bit of questions. Um, let me see if there's another one. There's a lot of good questions. We need to answer them in the discussion forum. Um, Someone's asking if there's any concern of oxidation after you do back drill. I think that kind of covers it for today. Okay, um, I will get the questions answered and I will post on the forum and share the link with everyone. And I will send you the slides and recording tomorrow. Okay, that sounds great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Amit, Steve. Thank you, EMA, Ernie. And uh, see you next time. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, attendees, as well. Great questions.